All right, everybody. I apologize for the delay. There was some technical difficulties on my end, um, but we are here with Dr. Liz Mathias. She is, well, I'll let her tell you who she is, but let me just give a brief intro because I have known Dr. Liz for 20 years now. Does it feel like 20 years? Holy smoke. Um, <laughs> well, we that were, means we're 20 years younger, that's all. That's exactly what it means. And Liz and I worked together at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. We worked at the Regional Center for College Students with Learning Disabilities, and that's where we met. I taught the sciences, ended up doing a few more things than that. And uh, Dr. Liz, before she was Dr. Liz, was a counselor. And it, I, it always amazed me how she was able to connect with the kids there. And really, I knew she chose the right path. Chose the right path. And here we are 20 years later. She's uh, doing an amazing job still. So tell us how you hey. got into this and a little bit about yourself for everybody. So I'm a clinical and school psychologist um, in private practice, but I started off in working in the public schools, went on to private schools, and then uh, went into private practice because it gave me the most flexibility to be able to do what I wanted to do, which was therapy, but also testing and uh, being able to work with kids with special needs and offer them the support they need with the child study teams at school. So it, it gave me a really unique perspective and it gave me the flexibility to do whatever I wanted. Um, and that changes every couple of years. And I, if you look at my resume, I kind of bopped around a little bit just because I, I needed to do more. And I had this spirit of like, I need to do more and I wanted to figure out how I was gonna do it. And so working um, within the school got to be a little too frustrating for me. So here I am. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So. It is it a continual, continually evolving journey? You, you see yourself where you are now, continuing pretty steady, or do you, in the the way things have kind of hit the fan recently, do you think it's going to change the way you practice? Um, I'm really not sure how the impact is uh, going to go with the practice, but you know, I'm open to, and I've always been from the beginning. I really didn't come in with an agenda, and so lately I've been meeting with a lot of different professionals were like, okay, what's your vision? I was like, wow, I, I don't really have one. <laughs> I'm kind of just open. I'm kind of open to whatever comes my way. I, you know, I really do embrace new opportunities as they arise. I've realized how much I love blogging and writing, um, which is not something that I really knew about myself. I would have never pegged myself for a blogger, um, but I love it. I really enjoy it. I love the engagement that it brings. I love being able to offer information to help someone without them having to come into the office. So that has really um, opened up some doors there. And I don't know, I'm very open to whatever comes next. And I think right now it's just the focus is providing support for the children and the adolescents and the families that we're working with and just taking it day by day. Great, and that's, uh, and that's huge. And that's actually a great spr springboard for the first question. I had people kind of reach out to me. Um, and parents are stressed trying to, they're working from home now. The kids are online schooling. What's the best way do you feel to get everybody to kind of work it symbiotically at best, but just not to kill each other and to really get everything done that needs to be done in this kind of new environment? I think um, I'm, in, I'm in the same boat. So I feel that frustration, like I was just saying to you before we went live, I am mm -hmm. not made to be a teacher. Um, I commend every teacher everywhere. I think they deserve a billion dollars a year, especially for teaching my kids. Um, <laughs> I think it's, we really have to find a routine um, in the midst of, there's no routine and you know we're so used to getting up at a certain time and going somewhere mm -hmm. and doing something and now we have to initiate that, which is hard. So setting up a time that we wake up every day, a time that we go to sleep every day and having set meal times. Um, and then as parents is being very forgiving because being, being a teacher and being, and working, it's, it's just not a sustainable kind of balance. So it's doing what you can when you can. And I know right now, like I'm getting my 13 year old and my 11 year old and my husband on board with all right, you're going to take this subject and you're going to take this subject and tell me when, you know, when you can do this. And if we don't get to it, we don't get to it. You know, and right. that's just ultimately it's the forgiveness of I didn't get to every single subject. Oh, you missed the Google Meet time today. 
oh well. Right. Life will go on. Just stay safe. <laughs> that's it, because they're still kind of like in a crisis mode. And I think that's huge about routines. And I think people kind of miss out on that because it just falls apart. It's almost like you're in summer mode when you're not. And it's easy to sleep in, you know, if you log into school, you can do it from bed. So you don't have to get up and have your breakfast and you don't have to, you know, if you're going to exercise and you normally do that, you can't get to the gym now. So I think routines is definitely key for keeping people kind of in line. Yeah. And um, having a separate, having a separate workspace. So, you know, right. I, I'm working with several high school and college age students and it, you know, I hear, well, I'm just going to wake up, take my laptop and start working. And I, and I said, you know, I, sleep in. If you don't have to be up at a certain time, fine, take advantage of the fact that you can sleep in. But once you sleep in to your Mac, then get up and get ready, go put change your clothing, go downstairs and eat breakfast, and then go to a designated workspace so that when you're done, you can leave that designated workspace so that your home feels like your home, and not just this big mishmash of places. Right. That's true. And do you think now this just kind of came to me when you said make your workspace your workspace, if a lot of people start working from bed, especially more so I'm guessing kids, but I mean, anybody can. Mm -hmm. Do you think that turns the bedroom then into an area where you're, it's going to be harder to go to sleep at night? Yes. Yes. And uh, my daughter just went through that and she was sitting and working in her bed. And I was like, OK, if you're comfortable there and getting your work done then you're getting your work done. Right. But then when she was having a hard time going to bed, I said, you got to sit at your desk or come downstairs and find another space in the house where you can work. Um, but yeah, it, there has to be differentiation for us. Our, you know, our bed cannot become our, you know, our dinner table and our desk and our relaxation place. We have to differentiate now more than ever. We really need to differentiate those spaces so that our brain also gets the signal. It's time to sleep or it's time to eat or it's time to right. work. Yeah, and that's key. And right along with that, then what sort of health, um, self-care do you recommend for people going through this? Because, you know, even if they separate their spaces, it's still a stressful environment. Uh, what do you recommend people do to just kind of de-stress and take care of themselves so they don't hit that breaking point? Um, as parents, you figure out what time you're going to log on and what time you're going to log off. And then create a time where you can take a walk. If you have an exercise routine, maintain it. If you don't create one um, and then create maybe an hour at the end of the night where you're all together, but each person is doing something quietly. If you need to leave and find a separate space just so you can disconnect from everyone just physically and emotionally, um, then absolutely do that and do that a couple times a week if you need to, um, because we are in each other's space all day long. Yes, that is so true. And it's uh, at first it's fun and then it, it gets old fast. You love your family, fast. but you love your space. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Another thing, you know, we're constantly being bombarded by media. You can't turn it off, whether it's social media, whether it's TV, radio, uh, doom and gloom, scary things for kids. Uh, how do you kind of help kids get through that? They're afraid for themselves. They're afraid for their, their family members. And they're just really unsure because it's, it's just all real negativity and there's a lot of conflicting information out there. Yeah. And there's not a lot of focus on the fact that some people, lots of people are recovering. Yeah. Um, so what, what I've been telling all parents is turn off the news, just turn it off altogether. Don't listen to any podcast or anything like that. Turn it all off. If you're going to watch it, watch it after, you know, put it, AirPods in earbuds and listen to it privately turn on the news privately and don't have any conversation between parents in front of the, the kids, because even if you think they're in the next room or out there on another floor, they hear you they hear. and they're taking it all in. And um, the other part of what to say to them, um, my suggestion has been just answer their questions. You know, when they ask a question, just answer that question and don't expand. It okay. could very well be just, an it, it could be, you know, like, I, my seven-year-old is quite oblivious to everything that's going on. And then my 13-year-old is very aware of everything that's going on. In fact, he's telling me stuff that I didn't even know. Okay. Which, uh, so for him, it's, you can, you can take little snippets of information and then come and tell me what you've heard today. What did you hear today? Or for my 11-year-old, she's asking questions more about when are we going to go back? 
Right, of course. And it's, I don't know, but we'll take it day by day. We're all here together and we'll figure it out. I mean, not very comforting, but it's the truth and it's where we are. Yeah, it is. Um, along that definitely kind of tying into that is, you know, with everything going on, us not knowing when it's going to end, there's a lot of big events in schools for kids, my adults as well, you know, they have weddings that they had planned and now it's, you know, down to just the bride, the groom and the priest from, and they got to stand six feet apart. But for kids, they're missing out on, you know, graduations, proms, big events like that. How do you prevent depression when, I mean, they're dealing with, for them, you know, at that age, you know, we're looking back, you know, I barely remember my prom. It wasn't that big a deal. But when you're in the moment, that's your life. How do you it kind is. of help them deal with that? So I have two. I have an eighth grader and a fifth grader. And this is their fifth, you know, these are their graduating right. years with lots of fun activities at the end of the year, you know, leading up to that. And, you know, I don't know that it's necessarily our job or we have the capability to stave off depression. I think they're going to grieve and we have to let them grieve and just validate that, yeah, this is hard. And it's not fun and it stinks. Um, I was just talking to um, a neighbor from up the, stair, uh, up the stairs, up the street yesterday. Um, and she was saying to me, it really stinks that all the seniors aren't gonna get to graduate, but you're hoping four years when they graduate college, right? Or mm -hmm. they go on to that next major milestone that they will look back and this will just be a small blip. Right, right now it doesn't feel like a small blip. And I think as the adults, we can we can look, we know that in the end, everyone will be okay. And yes, it's unfortunate they miss this. So I think the best advice that I can really give is to say, let them be sad, validate their sadness, and let them know that it is, it, it's unfortunate, but it is impacting everyone equally. It's not like there's sure. anybody who's getting to do anything and they're not. Right. Like it's just it's sad and but it overall we are trying to help our community at large and that's where you want to direct your efforts. But if a child or a teenager or a young adult is feeling sad, it's okay. You know, it, it's not our job to take away those feelings. We want them to have those feelings but to be able to process them. So as they're processing, listen, validate, and then if they have any questions, again, just answer the question and don't go beyond that. Because right. I think as adults, we tend to be like, well, let me give you the information. Let me tell you how it all started. When it mm -hmm. could be, they just, they just want to know one small detail that satisfies their curiosity. And now we're on to the next thing. And, and you can even direct them by saying, what do you want to have for lunch? <laughs> or right. do you want to go take a walk so that you're not just getting lost in that moment with all those feelings and those questions and our own parental guilt and feeling the need to give more information, which can be overwhelming. Absolutely. And how do you take this to the next level if you're dealing with um, you know, children with special needs who thrive on the routine and it's totally disrupted now and they're just kind of confused and parents are trying to uh, deal with this when normally they have finally structured things as best they can and it's all falling apart. I think again, coming back to routine, creating a new routine we are we're in the midst of week four now mm -hmm. and for a lot of people a lot of kids a lot of adults we're starting to get used to this you know this is what it is this is what we do um i think for in us and for us in our house this week is spring break so all the school work is kind of gone which <laughs> is not a good thing if you ask me um <laughs> But it is what it is, and but as much as possible, doing the same things each day at around the same times. Of course, with flexibility. Right. But I think the biggest, the biggest, the hardest thing to have to adjust to is what are we doing? When I'm usually doing math right now, I usually mm -hmm. do morning sir 